In previous lectures, we've learned that there's a variety of different data types available for building phylogenies and for describing and identifying species, and perhaps, as we'll learn later on also, to distinguish and delimit species from one another. We've talked about morphological data and also at length about molecular data. And with molecular data, right now in 2020, we have arrived at a moment where we are basically in an embarrassment of riches. There's many different uh, data sets available, uh, whole genomes with uh, tens, of, tens of thousands of genes. Uh, so the bigger challenge now is to figure out which ones to choose. Now, over time, it's become pretty clear which kinds of genes are good for, for example, building phylogenies. And we've learned that you should probably use genes that are non-recombining. So it's probably a good idea to use genes that are maybe from mitochondria or chloroplasts. Uh, and also, it's probably good if these are single copies, uh, single copy genes, and if they evolve at just the right rate so this is a little bit of a goldilocks type of situation where when the gene evolves very slowly and it's very highly conserved well then maybe that doesn't help us very much because then simply not enough uh, differences accumulate between lineages for us to distinguish them uh, or on the other extreme maybe uh, if the gene evolves very rapidly well then any uh, diagnostic uh, character states, synapomorphies that have arisen, may already be swamped by further substitutions uh, in a process called saturation, uh, which then doesn't help us either. Uh, also, very rapidly evolving uh, genes are also much harder to align. So there's some optimum in the middle. And it's become pretty clear what some of these pretty good markers are for this. So for example, in animals, we've already seen the usage of CO2. Well, CO1 is also very commonly used, uh, cytochrome B as well. So for example, these are mitochondrial markers. For plants, uh, commonly we uh, use chloroplast markers such as RBCL or MATK. Uh, for fungi, we might use our DNA markers such as ITS. And for bacteria, we might use 16S. Now, if we know that, then perhaps it makes sense to build some kind of infrastructure to deliberately collect those markers and uh, uh, ingest them in a neatly curated database. And that's what BOLD does. And uh, BOLD in this way makes it possible to enact this pipeline shown here. So what's going on? Well, if we go from left to right, uh, biologists all around the world are collecting specimens, maybe collecting them in the field or maybe just discovering them in a natural history collection. And from those, they might sample a bit of tissue, like the leg of a bug or a bit of leaf, and take that to the lab. And then in the lab, they might extract DNA and then amplify one or more of these specific markers and uh, upload them to Bolt, which means sending to sending them to Guelph. You see here these buildings with the word Guelph on top. Well, that refers to a town in Canada, which is the headquarters of Bolt. And there, uh, after you know doing some quality checks, they uh, publish a record which has the sequence data, but also additional information, such as about the taxonomy, so links to species name, also links to the specimen from which the uh, sequence was obtained. And then that combination is uh, published and hosted in various ways. So there's also a, a mirroring process with GenBank. Also, these data might go on to uh, feature in a place such as the Encyclopedia of Life or uh, on the computer of research users. Now, in this lecture, we are going to use this infrastructure to build a phylogeny. 
And uh, we're going to do that in a slightly different way than what you've seen in earlier practicals, because here we're also going to dip our toes a very little bit in bioinformatics. And so what we're going to do is just work through some tiny bits of code. I'll demo them and I'll make the code available for you to reuse. But uh, the main point of this is simply to demonstrate the power of this approach. So what I hope you'll see is that with just a tiny bit of coding, you can automate some tasks so that you can scale them up enormously. And of course, then they also become reproducible. So you don't have to remember, oh, I needed to click this and then that and then that. No, you just have a little script and uh, you're off to the races. So the point here is simply to get inspired and uh, this is not just for nothing because uh, this kind of work and this kind of skill is really becoming more and more important for biologists. And I kind of expect that at least some of you will pick this up when you start doing your master's internships. And I also know that some of you have already picked this up when you did previous internships. So uh, please enjoy. Now let's first uh, have a quick look at the front door of uh, Bold. So let's have a look. It basically looks like any other life science database. So it's life science blue and um, it has gone through a couple of iterations. We're now at uh, version four. And it uh, stores a whole bunch of data. So you see very, very many barcodes have been deposited and uh, they do some kind of post-processing to organize them in bins, which are basically a type of clusters, which we'll talk about later. And those bins are kind of intended to coincide with species. So here, Bolt is aware that they've processed this many animal species, this many plants and this many fungi and other things. So it's, it's quite a lot of data. And the data, the really the central unit in this is the specimen record. So let's have a look at one of those. Well, here's what that looks like. This is a record for a little uh, butterfly. Here's the photo. And uh, well, here's what we know about it. So there's a bit of taxonomic information. There's this bin identifier. Here we have where it was collected and in what life stage, so as an adult. And so this is actually in Australia, in Queensland, and to be precise, uh, at these coordinates. This record was deposited by this institution. And then here we actually have our barcode. So in this case, What's been sequenced is indeed the uh, CO1 marker and then with a primer that sequenced it from the five prime begin and uh, resulting in a record of 407 base pairs, which are of course shown here. And then uh, also accompanied by the amino acid translation of the gene. So from that, we can, of course, then download the data manually and then we get something like this. So here's a FASTA record like we've already seen. So what do these look like? Well, every record starts with the greater than symbol and then follows the definition line. Now, uh, if you quickly recall what that looked like in GenBank, you'll remember that that was different. Now, they also started with an identifier, but then they didn't use this pipe symbol. And then here there was something else as well. So uh, this is just as a word of warning that the uh, FASTA file format is very free form. So you can have almost anything on this line. Uh, but then after that, well, there's your sequence data. So here, I guess the, uh, some of the sequencing didn't go quite so well. So these are these came out kind of ambiguous, so coded as Ns. And otherwise we have our uh, A's, C's, G's, and T's. 
So we can download that manually. We can also, uh, you know, per, per specimen, we can also do a taxonomic query at a slightly higher level. So for example, everything within the genus Danaus, and then we get this whole listing. And for that listing, we can also download the data associated with that. So then we uh, might get something that looks like this. And so this is again FASTA and not Finnish. And uh, here then you see, you know, what, what a uh, FASTA file with multiple records looks like when a Bolt produces it. So there's uh, again these definition lines and at least within itself Bolt is uh, very consistent in, in what's in these lines. So there's an identifier at the beginning, then the species name, and then the name of the marker. And then there could be these external identifiers which refer to GenBank, but not necessarily. So that's what this looks like. And you will also notice that CO1 is not the only show in town. So here you see that there's also other markers that we might retrieve for the same genus, right? So it's a little bit of a mixture of things. Now, okay, we can do that by hand. We can also talk to Bolt through its URL API. So what is a URL API? URL is a web address, right? Universal Resource Locator. API stands for Application Programming Interface. And what is basically meant by that is that in addition to just clicking on the URL, you can also do certain operations on it, like you can write a bit of code and that code then talks to the URL. Here Bolt uh, politely documents what sort of operations you can do on what sort of URLs. And now we are going to talk to the taxonomy API. And uh, we'll do that on uh, the command line. So we should have already had a little bit of uh, some examples of what that looks like. Basically, it is uh, as follows. So uh, in addition to us being able to interact with the operating system by clicking around with the mouse, we can also uh, interact with it by typing commands. So uh, that there's equivalent functionality in every operating system uh, under Windows. It uh, uses uh, the MS-DOS box um, on, their, on Mac and on Linux. It's referred to as the terminal. And here I've uh, opened the terminal window and I've opened a, uh, yes, just, just disregard this, uh, I've opened a folder with so far nothing in it. Right, so when I do a listing, what's there? Well, there's nothing there. So just a clean working directory. And in that working directory, I am going to run my first API command, and it's uh, this. So I'm going to execute the program curl, C-U-R-L, which does these types of operations on URLs. And we're going to run a taxon search on Bolt with this as our search parameter. So we're going to do another search for that genus Danaus, which we first did manually. And then we are going to want to have the output written to a file. So what it's going to produce is something called JSON. And we want this to go into an output file called Danaus.json. So I'll just select this. And then I'm going to paste that into my terminal window. And it did what it was supposed to do. So now let's do another listing. And there we have our output. And so if I just have a quick look at that, then I count to find out 
oh my goodness, this looks very garbled. I can't make any sense out of it. Well, that's fine. So what we are looking at is uh, something called uh, JSON, which you are all very, very familiar with because every time when you click like on an Instagram post or like on Facebook or like on anywhere else and not just like, but uh, every other operation pretty much that you can think of, then between your phone and the web server or between your laptop and the web server, bits of JSON are being sent back and forth with tiny little bits of information so that companies can follow you and all that good stuff. And that always is done with this format. And we can make it a little bit more palatable by uh, indenting it. So now it is... Uh, uh, just like uh, in, in one big blob, but we can actually show it uh, line by line. And here we're going to use a little bit of Python functionality without coding anything ourselves by just saying, well, let's use the JSON tool from Python and run that on that output file. Okay, now if I'm able to select this, yep, let's do it. Okay, so I'm going to just clear my screen. It just scrolls down, so there's nothing to clutter the screen. And I'm going to run that uh, JSON tool. And now you see the indentation. And maybe this reminds you a little bit of Newick in the sense that there's this nesting. So there's some nesting here and a bit more here and more here. So what are we looking at? Well, this is the response from our query and it has basically two things to say. One is, well, how many names did we match when we asked for Danaos? And it says, well, we matched one name. And then it's going to give us a list of the matched names. And you can tell that it's a list because it is between square brackets and in uh, JSON notation, that means a list. But uh, there was only one match, so the list contains only one element, and that's this one. And for that element it says, well, this is the taxon we matched, this is the ID of the taxon we matched, and then this is actually, the match is a genus, which by the way is an animal genus. And uh, these are, this is the parent, so the parent is here, the subfamily Danainei, with this ID. And what we could actually do then is walk up the taxonomy to then ask it for, okay, what's the parent of this parent and so on and so on. Um, now, Bolt also wants us to maybe see a representative image. And so for that, there's a little bit of nested uh, structure here with two fields. And unfortunately, a couple of typos have slipped in at uh, Bolt. So this is not how you write representative. And what they're referring to here is the aspect ratio, which is just the ratio of uh, width and height in the image. And then here there's a, a JPEG image that's supposed to uh, illustrate the organism. Now, let's say we want to do something with that. So for example, let's say we want to figure out what the location of that image is and we want to tease it out of the rest of that JSON data. This is just a little example of how we might write a client program that talks to the server and to the programming interface of the server. So this is a bit of Python code. Uh, Python is a scripting language just like R so you simply write code in a text file. So we are back to needing a text editor. Uh, and uh, it has facilities for importing additional libraries, just like there are packages in R, which we import here. There's a facility for defining variables. So here the first variable is the URL against which we are going to run our query. Then the second is, well, the URL library is going to open the URL and it's going to return a response. So that's going to be this variable. And then we're going to read that response and load the JSON response data. And 
now that that's read, we can traverse the data uh, as if we're kind of walking through a tree structure. So then we can say, well, let's look in the list of top match names and then iterate over that. And then if for that name there's a representative image, well, then let's print out the location of that image. So I'll just copy that and then go to my text editor and then paste that in here. And then I'm going to save this as, well, let's call it json.py, is that a good name? Now that I've done that, you can see that my text editor has recognized that this is Python because now it has applied some syntax coloration, so it recognizes some of these keywords. All right, let's clear my screen here again. Let's do a quick listing. Uh, now here's my script, so let's run it. Python json.py. And you can see that it's now actually fetched the JSON from the server and teased out the location of that image. So we wrote our first little API client. Of course, now imagine that you might do that for very many, many genera and all of a sudden you have a great big image bank. So you just have the same script, but you let it run on multiple genus names and you built up an image bank. Okay, that's neat, but I guess we were going to talk about sequence data. So uh, we can also talk to another uh, API endpoint. Uh, and this endpoint is for sequence data. So now we are going to query for a taxon name, but then we say, well, uh, for that taxon, give us back whatever sequence data you have. So let's do that. Let's go back to our terminal and paste the command. Let's go. All right. Here we have a whole bunch of data all of a sudden, right? Okay, that's nice, uh, but we can't just use that for uh, building phylogenies just like that, because obviously this file, as we already saw, is just a mixture of all of the different markers that Bolt has for that genus, and also they are not yet aligned. So we're not there yet. Let's have a quick look first at what's actually in our file. So the first thing I'm going to do is just filter out the definition lines. So we know that those start with the greater than symbol. So with this command, grep, you basically do a search or you can also do a search and replace. Um, and in this case, we're going to just search for all the lines that start with greater than symbol. And now we've extracted those and written them to the terminal window. Okay, that's nice. Uh, but what we actually want to do is see which markers are in there. So remember how there's the identifier in the definition line, then the taxon name, and then the marker name. Now what we can do is take the output of that initial search and use it as the input for the next command. So in the terminal, this vertical pipe symbol, if it is not quoted, becomes the input for the next command. So what we're going to do now is take these definition lines and then straight away plug them into this construct. And what this does is, well, it says, imagine if this is a record that is delimited in this case by these vertical pipes, just like data files might be comma separated, for example, right? So now split it on these 
symbols and then give me the third field f3 so that's going to then give me the marker names right so let's try that out Well, so this is a great big list of uh, these markers, and mostly it's CO1. Sometimes it's some other stuff, right? Okay, uh, now let's say we want to just know which ones are in there. Uh, so again, piping the output from one command into the input of another, we can then say, well, Let's sort these marker names alphabetically and then take all the distinct ones. So that, that last bit is actually what we're most interested in, this unique command, which gives us the distinct marker names. But unique uh, only takes uh, sorted input, so we first have to pre-process it a little bit. So let's run that. Uh, I'm just going to switch to my terminal. Here we are. Oops. So that's all the markers that were in there. So that's actually quite a few. Um, but by just scrolling through it, we'd already seen that actually by far most of them are C015 prime. Now. What are we to do? Well, one thing that we can do is we can say, uh, let's just only filter out CO1. And then also let's say we just want pretty, pretty long markers. Like uh, even if you start from the same five prime end, uh, of course, depending on which primer set you use, you might not uh, amplify the whole thing, but only part of it. Now let's say we don't want pretty long stretches. So here now we are going to do a little bit more Python. In this case, we are going to read the uh, FASTA data and also you know, the sequence data that's in the FASTA file uh, because we want to do a little bit more than just operate on the definition lines. So now we're going to use BioPython, which is basically the Swiss army knife in Python if you want to operate on any kind of DNA sequence data. So here, from BioPython, we import seek.io, which is the sequence input output library, which reads different sequence formats. So we're going to open our file, and then we are going to uh, read in the records that are contained in the file, um, treating the file as FASTA, so that it knows how to interpret the data that's in there. And then for each of these records, we are going to take the record description and split that on this uh, pipe symbol. Remember, that was the separator in bold. So then we have the fields as a little list, and then we take the third element in the fields and in python we start counting at zero so the third element has index two zero one two it's the third one and we want that to be called co one five p and we want uh, our sequence to have the length of uh, 1246 bases so if both of those conditions are met so it's both this and that then we uh, print out our definition line and the sequence data. Let's copy this and let's paste that into a new file. And now let's go and run it. So here now we've created the script fasta.py. If I run that just like that, 
uh, there will be a fire hose of data. Um, now here's the trick. We want that output to end up in a file. Uh, we do that by redirecting like this. Oops, five, us. So here, uh, the important part is this construct, which says, well, redirect the output into a file, and then we can give this whatever name we like. So in this case, uh, this seemed like a sensible name. Now there's no output produced except, well, there is, except it just goes straight into the file that we want it to go into. Okay, uh, then let's try to align this. Now, because Bolt is uh, very nicely curated, the chances of us encountering something that needs to be reverse complemented are smaller than with GenBank, so we can be kind of uh, uh, courageous and just run this through muscle right away. So I'll... Uh, copy this and I'm now going to run a alignment with muscle by pasting that here. Okay, this won't take uh, all that long. Here we are. Um, Now then, what do we have here? So we have, wait, let me just clear the screen so we're not distracted too much. We have here our original file, which we downloaded with curl, remember? And out of that, we filtered just the co 15 prime sequences. You can see here, just by the file sizes that CO1 was about one quarter of the total, okay? Then we aligned that, and so then here we have the size of the file that came out of the aligner, and well, the file size can only go in one direction, namely a little bigger, right? Because we are uh, going to insert uh, zero or more gaps, aren't we? Now, the fact that the size hasn't inc increased all that much is pretty encouraging because that probably means there's nothing super garbled going on. It's probably a pretty clean alignment. So let's just have a quick look. And you see this, so this is aligned faster now, but you can see that this is actually very clean. So basically these markers, there's just no gaps at all. Okay, so that's nice. Now, we had a little bit of uh, debate earlier about, well, do we use muscle, do we use math? Um, why not both? So here, let's use the other one, and then we'll just do a, a compare and contrast just to see how you might do that programmatically, just to see if there's any uh, discrepancies. So here now I'm going to uh, align the same unaligned input data using MUFT. I'll paste that in my terminal. Oops. Also very fast. Okay, so it turns out that these two files here are exactly the same size. Now that doesn't actually mean that the alignments are exactly the same. They just have exactly the same number of symbols in them, but obviously gaps could be in different places, for example, right? So let's see if we can just programmatically do a bit more of a comparison. Now, what does it actually look like when we look at this? Okay, that looks like this. Hmm. 
and this looks like this okay so it's the same number of symbols but actually alignments look different don't they so there's different records here at the beginning uh, and capitalization is different so this is actually kind of hard to compare isn't it now first things first so the byte size the, you know the file size in bytes is uh, the same but the contents are different and in this case this was uh, blatantly obvious right away what if it's not so obvious well here's one thing that you know a technique that you probably should know about which is uh, the application of what are known as checksums so what's a checksum well uh, every file is basically just a great big sequence of bytes and there's a number of different uh, algorithms and little software programs in existence that go through that byte sequence and then do a, a great big calculation on that to in the end return what's called a checksum which is like a, a kind of like an identifier that uniquely summarizes the contents of the file so if i run that on this file so i'm going to run the md5 algorithm well then it says okay the contents of the file could be summarized uh, thusly uh, 64c 8bc 417bc okay that doesn't tell me that much the main question is is it same or different so if i do that on the other file we have a, a different output now, what are some of the contexts where you might use this? Well, so for example, when you're downloading very, very large files, like maybe uh, next-gen sequencing data files, which are you know tens of gigabytes, you want to be very, very sure that the download succeeded successfully and that there wasn't some kind of little glitch where, uh, oops, we dropped a couple of bytes, uh, or you know the download was truncated somehow well then here's how that works so the uh, server that posts these data if they're polite and major sequencing initiatives are polite then they also post on their website the md5 checksum okay then you do the download for that file and then locally you compute that checksum again and then you know oh that's the same that good that's good that worked uh, in this case not same so problem Okay, well, I suppose there's a, a difference between, you know, substantial differences, such as really different alignments, and just things maybe being capitalized in a different way, or uh, being uh, ordered in a different way. And you already saw that in one of the practicals, that the different aligners actually produce their output in a different order, which, of course, is not substantially different it's just in a different order but the alignment itself where the bases are is the same so here we have another bit of code which is going to make our files comparable so here what we're going to do is well we're going to use a bunch of things again from biopython and they are uh, in combination going to do the following so again we are going to open the file as fasta and we're going to uh, iterate loop over all of the input files. And then what we're going to do is we're going to basically keep a running tally of all of the different records we come across. And each of those we are going to store under their identifier. So here what we do is, well, we take the definition line and we split that again on that uh, vertical pipe symbol. And then we're taking the very first word this time. So that's the identifier. This is just so that we know that they're all unique. And then we take the sequence and we uh, transform that to uppercase. So then once we've seen all of the records in the file, well, then we are going to create a new alignment where those records are uh, 
reordered, namely sorted alphabetically on their identifier. We could sort it however we like, but just so that we are sure it is done the same way across a uh, muft and muscle. And then we uh, write that output to a file. Now, there's another kind of neat trick in here, which is that we also use the system library, which allows us to define command line arguments such as, well, what's the input file? what is the output file and what is the file format that we want to write to. This gives us some flexibility because then we can use the same script for both files, can't we? Because they have different names. And then we can just reuse our code. Okay. The first argument for our converter was the input file. The second is whatever we want to call it. So let's call it sorted. And then the third is what format we want to use for the output. We just want to keep it FASTA for now. So did that to the first one, then let's do that to the second one. Okay, uh, we could uh, do the uh, MD5 sums again. We can also just look, okay, are there any differences? So you can compare multiple text files and run what's called a diff on it and then it will show exactly where there are differences. So if there's for example some difference in the alignment uh, it will now be shown. Turns out there's no difference at all so the only difference between the output was uh, of the two programs was uh, insubstantial let's say. All right, now finally we wrote our little converter and what was neat about it is that we could also specify what the output format is. So one way in which we can use that is to actually just convert our data into something else. So for example, um, if I take one of these and I call it phi because I want it converted to phylib. Now we've created a phylib output file. So what does that look like? Well, uh, on the first line, the first word is the number of taxa. So our alignment has, has 119 taxa. Then second is the number of bases. And then the first word each time is a word of 10 characters, which is the um, name of the sequence. So in this case, we're kind of lucky that we just kept these identifiers because those are unique. And then following that is the sequence data. And in this case, this is what's called interleaved, which means that uh, it creates a block of some predefined width and then uh, it continues on with the next block which you have to imagine in your head just comes after it uh, and then the next block and the next block and so on and so on. So that's uh, interleaved data and uh, this file format is actually the format that uh, RexML is uh, happy with. So uh, we can run a little tree search. Now I have to update the command a little bit. The file file that I just created was called like this. And on my laptop, 
RxML is just called RxML, like this. Uh, you're probably aware what this is, right? The uh, uh, general time reversible model with the gamma parameter. And this is just a random number seed. Go. Okay, so that is now attempting to build a tree. And I suppose this will finalize. There we are. And now it would be kind of nice if we could uh, look at the tree. So that, that's an, something old that I still had open. Nope. Uh, okay, so RexML produces a whole bunch of output files uh, among which are the best tree which is this thing, uh, and I can copy that to the clipboard like this. And then what is quite neat about fig tree is that you can just paste the new wig in there and there we go. And then we might do things such as root the tree on the midpoint and so for example like this and um, there's our high throughput tree so I guess what we would now want to do is map back to actual taxon names and stuff like that but um, here you go a little bit of bioinformatics <laughs>